everyone. This is Anastasia Gores from PilatesBridge.com. Welcome to the expert interview series on Pilates Bridge. Today, I'm talking to Jessica Spillane. She's the creator of the revolutionary new way of delivering Pilates teacher training to studios and aspiring new teachers. Whether you're a studio owner, a Pilates teacher, or a Pilates student just thinking about a career in Pilates, Jessica has some great nuggets of wisdom for you. Specifically, we will discuss the following topics. We will talk about the effective ways to market a teacher training program at your studio, regardless of how you run your teacher training, how a teacher training program can benefit your studio, and some of those items can really surprise you. And if you are an aspiring new teacher or just a beginner teacher, we will discuss one of the biggest struggles that all new Pilates teachers have, how to become confident in teaching bodies or new clients in front of you. And finally, we will also get a sneak peek at Jessica's teacher training curriculum and cover some of the most frequently asked questions that she gets. So without further ado, I'm going to let Jessica introduce herself, share a little bit about her Pilates fashion and her Pilates story. Thank you so much for having me, Anastasia. It's great to spend my morning with you. And I will apologize in advance if there's sounds in the background. We are on vacation and the kids might start waking up and moving into the kitchen and that kind of thing while we're talking. But uh, they will stay quiet. Uh, so Pilates has been an amazing journey, right? It's been an amazing journey for all of us. Um, I started as a student of Pilates because I had massive back issues at a young age too young to have back issues. And um, a doctor that I trusted, you know, deeply had told me, you need, and this is going back almost 30 years ago, he said, you need to do Pilates. Otherwise, you're going to end up in, in bad shape as you age. And so he was so um, ahead of his time when you're going back 30 years and a doctor telling, telling me that movement, not a pill, was going to solve my problems, right? So I started doing it as a, as a student and I fell in love with the movement modality. And when it came time, at the time I was working in Manhattan in an advertising agency. And as my life and my career progressed and I moved into the stage of life where I wanted to have children, I realized that that New York City, high flying, high, you know, high speed career path wasn't going to align with my goals as a mother. So I that's what pushed me into that, um, that, that decision to become trained as a Pilates teacher. I went to Power Pilates in Manhattan. I have an it, it, highest respect for them and their program. Uh, I did that over 20 years ago. I've lost count at this point. And I did it with the goal of opening up my own studio within one year. And I did that almost to the day, almost to the day. And from opening up the studio, it was just a constant evolution, constant evolution of, you know, growing, expanding, bringing in new programming, bringing in new, hiring new teachers, struggling to find new teachers, which is then what gave birth to my teacher training program in 2009. So I have been running a teacher training program since 2009, and it's only since COVID that I've made this sort of migration to offering the teacher training program to a, like on a worldwide to a worldwide audience. All right. So let's talk about COVID. You know, obviously it yes. was quite a, <laughs> quite a crazy time for a lot of us, especially for you, um, like yep. being in New Jersey, New York area that, you know, I'm not from there, but I hear it was like yeah. way tougher than where I am in Florida. Um, yeah. I know I have a lot of clients, um, like studio owner clients, and unfortunately their businesses suffered. A couple of them had to close down their studios because of all everything that was going on at the time. But for you, you took this opportunity this time to completely change or flip the direction of your business. So That's what great. inspired you to do it? How did you find the courage to do it? <laughs> yes. Um, well, courage, I think, is something that I've never really lacked. Um, I don't know why, but I've always had, uh, I see opportunities all over the place. And COVID, I viewed as an opportunity. It was an opportunity to sort of get off the hamster wheel 
and working 40, 50 hours a week, which I had been, you know, I, I became a Pilates teacher and studio owner because I thought it was going to slow down my life, but it didn't happen at all, right? It was the complete opposite, but that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> but um, so it was, to me, it was an opportunity. I had been running the teacher training program for at that point, uh, 15 years. It was uh, one of my favorite parts of studio ownership and one of the, my favorite parts of my career. And I just couldn't see letting it go. I just couldn't see letting it go. I had an easier time with the idea of letting go of my studio than I did letting go of the teacher training program. And I decided to use it as an opportunity to put a fresh coat of paint on, that's how I describe it, on my curriculum. I had, back in 2009, I had written this manual, right? It's a very comprehensive manual, beautiful pictures. I did all the photography. I hired a designer to do the manual, but since 2009, I hadn't updated it. I hadn't taken a new look at it. I hadn't added anything. I hadn't modernized anything because I just was too busy using it. I was very much in the, you know, in the cycle of, of constant uh, trainings. So I was like, this is a moment where I can take a look at this, do some edits. And I started to do that. And I got out my red pen and I started marking up my manual. But at the same time, we were introduced to this Zoom world. I had my children who were on, in school online. I was offering Zoom classes to my clients. I was signing my kids up for little dance classes that were taking place in Chicago, but it was a way for them to get movements, right? And so I sort of started to think about pulling all of this together. Like, how could I pull this together? If I'm going to take a new look at the curriculum, why don't I really push it over the edge into 2020 and where we are now in this new learning experience? It was a huge technological learning curve, right? I, so I hired a videographer. I rented a small space that I could convert into like a, a film location. I moved one piece of each uh, one um, piece of each apparatus into that film location. We did COVID testing every week. I got one one of my clients, um, and we we did it. We filmed every single exercise, a bunch of different sequences, a bunch of different progressions, a bunch of different modifications, and then I said, "Okay, now what do I do?" <laughs> And I started researching how to kind of serve this up as a curriculum. So it took a solid year. It took a solid year. It kept me very busy. It kept me stimulated. It kept me motivated during a time when I think all of us and I could have gone into a depression. I could have slipped into, you know, bad eating habits and bad drinking habits and all that. But instead, I, I took the other the other lane that was offered. And I used it as motivation and inspiration to do something new and create, find the creator in me again. Awesome. No, it's, um, it's really great that you were able to take that, uh, that time. And again, like not, instead of wasting it or right. like you said, going into depression, but just doing something with it. So you started talking a little bit about already uh, the types of materials that you created for your teacher training program, but can you share a little bit more about how your curriculum or how you, how's your way of delivering uh, yeah. teacher training different from a lot of other teacher training school certifications, whatever we're going to call them? Absolutely. So uh, one of the things that I always want to differentiate is the online curriculum that I've created that is not the program, right? The pro is a component of the program. I look at it as a study tool. We have all different types of learners out there. There are people who love to walk around with the manual. They like to take ferocious notes. They keep it in their pocketbook. They read it before they go to bed. Um, and then there are other people who like to throw on their AirPods and like to listen and they learn that way. And having the repetition of hearing um, the cues, hearing the technique, hearing the breath placement, hearing the flow, that repetition going in through you know, an auditory processing is much more effective. So now we have both. Where I used to be very one-dimensional with the hard copy manual, we now have these two different uh, platforms for people to learn. 
We layer that on top of the live component. The live component is still ever present. Uh, it's the cornerstone of the program. So this is not a online Pilates teacher training. And I want to make sure that there is that distinction because there are many that are out there. You can go on right now, you can purchase, and you never have a human unless you need to call customer support. And then there are still the teacher training programs that exist only in studio, in person. And there is no online component to help reinforce what they're learning. That's where I'm trying to carve that path in the middle, right? We, we sort of have those two handles at the end and I'm trying to carve that path in the middle and, and make Pilates teacher training more accessible. So what I've done by having the online curriculum, by having the hard copy manual, and by partnering with studio owners around the world who are my hosts, a student or a prospective student has the opportunity to get the best of everything. They have the reinforcements with the online curriculum from what they hear and what they see in person. They have the apprenticeship that takes place live and under the supervision of senior level teachers and studio owners. And they can ob observe, they can practice, and they can get real-time feedback from the hosts. They have live seminars, trainings, and workshop trainings with me. And then they have their hard copy reading material. So I've really pulled everything into one place, as opposed to it being a little, you know, just one sort of dimension, whichever dimension that might be, I'm trying to pull it all together under one umbrella. Okay. So let me ask you, when you're talking about the live component of the teacher training, is it you or one of your teachers being at the studio, senior teachers being at the studio, at the host studio and actually instructing, or is some of it as a Zoom seminar and the host studio teachers basically supervising and giving their input? How's that part structured? Great question. So it, it takes place over Zoom. I have converted that, that small location that I told you I had rented back in 2020 to film. I've actually converted it into a production studio now. So I have multi cameras and I have multi microphones and lighting and everything set up. So it's a nice, clear picture. My hosts set up, a, a, they, I give them sort of technical um, requirements. So they have a screen where I am projected, but they also have camera, a camera so that I can see the students in their, in their studio at the time of seminars. So on seminar day, we all gather and each host has their screen and their camera set up so I can see and they can see me. They are together in their location and I am in my location. I have a person with me at my studio and we go through each and every one of the exercises. So I teach it, we talk about it. We talk about what sort of uh, teaching, whatever teaching principles I'm, I'm talking about that particular seminar and I apply it to that exercise. Then I teach it again and then they teach it. And I pop around in breakout rooms and I go with, I visit each studio and I listen to each person who's teaching and I offer feedback. They also are at their location with a studio owner or with a senior teacher who might be supervising. And I have constant communication with those people. They're like, at this, at our studio here in Washington, Jessica, we're struggling with the springs. What can you go back to that? No problem. So we all gather and I say, all right, let's go back to talking about springs. I got some questions about springs. People pop on and ask questions in the chat or they raise their hands and we have discussion that everyone participates in. All right. So it's like so it's very interactive. Yeah. So when you're teaching a seminar, it's not just to one student in particular, you will have a cohort, so to say, Correct. like of different locations. That's right. So I have like my last um, semester, I had 30 students and they were spread over 12 different studios. Okay. So all the studios tapped in. So there were basically 12, maybe 15 boxes up on the screen. They all tapped in. And in each one of those boxes, there may have been three students, five students, depending upon what the studio had as, as enrollment. All right. 
So let's talk, and I already see one benefit here, but I'm going to let you talk about it. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask, like, what are the benefits of hosting your style of teacher training um, at a studio for the studio owners? Yes. Okay. So a few different things. The first is I want the studio owner to partner with me in the success of the program. So what that means is instead of having the studio owner pay, pay me to come and do this training for them, I pay them. I compensate the studios for the usage of their studio, of their space, of their equipment, of their, their mind, their knowledge. And that is a that is a something, a standard that doesn't exist in our industry right now. Um, most teacher training programs, they require that the studio owner meet certain minimums. And if they don't meet those minimums, the studio owner is on the hook to pay whatever the, the difference is. And then the a master teacher will leave and the studio owner now has these apprentices who are working out of their studio and there's no compensation, right? There's no compensation for the studio owner's time. And there's also no guarantee that any of these people are going to become employees for that particular studio owner. So that's the first benefit is I am compensated. I give them 20% of each tuition that comes in. So if they have an enrollment of five people, they're getting 20% times five. So, and I do all of, I try to do all of the heavy lifting. If they want to be more involved, they can be more involved. I welcome that. But at the same time, I don't require it because usually people are hosting because they need teachers. They are, they are drowning in work. They are drowning in um, the amount of time that the studio is, is sucking from them to begin with. So that's why they've, they've called me to start. Um, the second benefit is there is the potential for an employee. There is the potential for multiple employees. The apprenticeship is a real and true apprenticeship. So I do encourage the studio owners at a certain point in the apprenticeship to start delegating beginner classes to the, apprentice, to the apprentices. Maybe you're going to do a promotional class for your local school's PTO, a fundraiser. Use the apprentice for that class. Have the apprentice give a studio tour so you can schedule someone, a new client to come in, tour the studio. And it's great practice for the apprentice to start getting that language seamless and that articulation of what we do to that new client. Maybe there's 30 minute intro sessions that you want to offer and you don't have the staff to do it right now. Now you have apprentices who can do that. So that's another benefit. The last benefit is studio owners who want to either offer promotion opportunities or growth opportunities to their staff or who want it for themselves have that opportunity through this to step in as mentors. They can become the lead. They can become the person, the lead at that studio who manages the apprentices. And it might spark something in them again, right? It inspires you. Whenever you have a new crop of new learners, it's like you see what we do through new eyes again, and it's, it inspires you, and it's a growth opportunity. So you might have a senior teacher who's looking for more, who's been teaching for 15 years. She's growing stale. This is an opportunity for you to say, I'm going to give you this, this opportunity. You can mentor them. You can re give them reviews. You can have weekly meetings with them. And because I'm compensating the studio owner, she then can also pay that person a bonus, right? Or pay that person an additional salary. So there's growth and evolution for the studio as a whole as well. And then um, the question I had about like the apprenticeship at the studio. So when the studio uh, obviously has all this apprentices, we need to get their observation and practice hours. Mm -hmm. Is those hours, are they part of the tuition that the student mm -hmm. pays you or does it go directly to the studio? It is part of the tuition that the student pays me. So many uh, of the online programs that are out there, the apprenticeship is not a component, right? Mm -hmm. They offer the curriculum and then they, the, the student is left on their own to find a studio that they can do their apprenticeship at. And then they knock on that door and then that owner is kind of like, okay, sure, you can apprentice, um, but I need to charge you. So maybe it's, you know, $20 an hour. Well, $20 an hour for a 300 hour, 400 hour, 500 hour apprenticeship, that winds up being a whole nother tuition unto itself. 
So that is part of this partnership is the fact that I pay these uh, studio owners, I compensate them for the use of the studio for their students' apprenticeship. Okay. Now I'm gonna caveat that and say the studio owner puts boundaries. We all have to respect whatever the, that studio owner um, says are the boundaries of the apprenticeship. So they might say there is no practicing during the hours of 8 to 11 a.m. You can only observe. Or I have these three clients who don't want you to observe them at all, so you cannot come in on Tuesdays. The apprentice has to respect whatever that owner's boundaries are. I do ask that they make the studio available a minimum of 15 hours a week, uh, but that's my really my only request is that there, we at least meet that threshold for them. And then when they um, the students, they need to apprentice and practice teaching somebody, is it the studio's responsibility to give them the bodies or the apprentices need to bring their own whoever? So I leave that it's the apprentices have to bring their own people at first, right? Because I really only want the apprentices working with people that they know and trust who are going to be cheerleaders for them because that's a confidence building phase, right? Those, those first hundred hours are confidence builders. So I want your best friends. I want your mom. I want your, not the spouse. The spouse is usually, it usually goes bad with the spouse. I want your, you know, 20 something daughter to be your, your body because I want you to build your confidence and not be worried that, that they don't like you, right? That's always going to be a vulnerable feeling. After that, the apprentice can still start to curate their own bodies. The apprentices can share bodies, right? They can all sort of say, yeah, you can teach my mom and I'll teach your mom, right? But at a certain point, um, I do ask that the studio owners put out an email, put out a promotion that there are apprentice sessions. And so there are a discounted session and the studio has to put in a little bit of effort to help get, get the apprentice strangers right? Because teaching a stranger now is a whole nother experience after you've been te in that safe place with your mom and your best friend. Now teaching a stranger, you got to, you got to deliver, you know, you have to perform. So I do ask the studio owner help with that, but it's not that it's like, you have to have five clients for them, you know, by the end of November, that's not how, how it works. Okay. So um, I like have one more question because this is some of the questions that come up as from, yeah, absolutely. from the times when I got training and I was looking for different programs. Um, so obviously you mentioned that you were originally certified with Power Pilates. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of studios and we know that like there are different styles of teaching Pilates, even though Correct. Pilates is the same, but yep. and some people are very particular, their studios about the style mm -hmm. of teaching yes. that they like. And we're not going to go into that uh, debate. But how for your program, would you say that it stays more true to the classical form of teaching or would you call it more contemporary? And also how um, so that's one question, the one on top of it do you set certain requirements or anything from the studios just to make sure that their teaching style corresponds with your teacher training approach? So great question and a common one. So I am Power Pilates certified. So that means I'm classical, right? I am, a, I come from the Ramana lineage down through, through her. And that is how I teach these students. However, I am a believer that we have to teach the body in front of us and classical purist classical is not for everyone. And I want my students to know the rules, to know the fundamentals, to know where this comes from, to know the why and the objective behind every single movement that we do before they start modernizing it or bringing it into the contemporary space. So in the advanced seminar, I do start drifting into contemporary. I start showing them how we can reorganize things or how we can uh, progress in a different way than what classical typically lays out for us. Because I do that with my own clients. I'm a classical teacher who teaches in a contemporary way, but I'm always adhering to the principles of Pilates. I'm always going back to the roots. And that's what I want for the students. Know where you come from, know the rules before you start breaking the rules. 
kind of like if, you know, if you have to learn how to, you know, to do classical ballet before you do modern dance or a classical guitar before you start rocking out, you know, in a punk band. It's just understanding where it all comes from. And I think that maintains the integrity of our industry, but it also allows us to be open and we should be open, right? There's so many, so much hard lining in our life to begin with. Pilates shouldn't be one of them. So that's, that's my theory. Now, I do not require that the, that the studio owners adhere to my system in order to, for their apprentices to, uh, to observe. I actually like the fact that there are different voices and apprentices are being exposed to different approaches and different thinking. And I want them to ask questions like, why did you do that? And they then can come back to me and say, so I was observing and this teacher did this and I asked why. And that might be new, something new to me. And I'd be like, oh, that's awesome. Or I, I understand why she did that. And here's what her thinking was. So it creates dialogue. And the more we create dialogue, the more layers are going to be built in that brain in the, in the little Pilates quadrant. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So uh, let's get back to a little bit of the business aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And um, as I mentioned, I work with a lot of studios as well. And a lot of them, they do need their new teachers. And I think that's like the biggest benefit yeah. for the studios. And some of them have even tried bringing in the teacher trainings, just like you mentioned from some of the big names, big things. And it just didn't work out because they were not able to generate those minimum requirements, like minimum number of students necessary to run the program. You know, sometimes for, especially for some of the smaller areas, let's say, um, finding four people who would go through a teacher training program who will commit to that is not such an easy thing. It's, you know, Pilates is not as mainstream as maybe some other okay. things. So what would be your marketing advice for the studios who want to host your program? How can, how do you help them to market the program and to generate uh, those leads for their teacher training? So uh, the first thing I do is I do provide a marketing plan and I try to have as many um, done and complete posts and emails and scripts and landing pages. I do all of that for them. Again, this goes back to studio owners don't have time, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to help do, but kind of do all that back end for them. So really all they have to do is press post. I'm perfectly happy if they want to do it themselves, if they're, if they're social media gurus or they have somebody on staff who does that for them, they don't have to use my stuff, but it's there for them if they want. Um, so I try to provide all of the marketing I can. I also provide them sort of the, I, the, the, uh, who we're going after, I guess, who's the target audience and who I have found after so many years of doing this, I see repeats you know, the, the repeat of the same type of person coming back and coming to the program. So I give them all of the information about who that person is so that they can effectively talk to that person. Uh, I give them a script that their, their other teachers or their front desk person can use when talking about the program, when, uh, when they answer the phone and there's an inquiry about the program. Now, the, a new thing I'm testing out this, you know, each semester I do something different to try to be better or learn more or, you know, somehow add another layer of, of dimension to it. So this semester I'm testing out uh, an online media strategist in three markets. So I have three hosts and I've chosen their studio, their location, and we're going to do a concentrated one month uh, paid campaign on Facebook, Instagram, Google, you know, doing search and when they're playing solitaire, an ad will pop up. I don't, I don't know all the terminology for it, but to be truthful, but I'm putting money against those three markets to see what it does, learn from it. And if it's successful, I will offer that as a kind of an add-on benefit to hosts in future semesters. Some people can sign on for it. Some people don't have to, if they feel like they've got that, whatever it might be. So I'm trying to sort of, I keep building it each semester. I keep building what I, what I'm offering. 
Hi. And then um, another question, like still on the marketing, since you've been in the business and you've been running your own uh, Pilates teacher training program way before you started this online mixed approach yes. to it, from your experience of promoting the teacher training programs, what do you think are, in, in order of importance, the most important marketing channels for the studios to utilize? There, the first and foremost is talking about it in studio because most people don't even realize how many clients who are laying right there in front of them every Tuesday and Thursday at that 9 a.m. class, how they might, how they see themselves that they could do this. They might be in a transition in their life and they see themselves making this move. They love what they're doing. They love your studio. They love coming there. It's a place that brings them joy to begin with. Why don't I now add this new dimension to myself? So that's going to be your number one feeder are the people who already know and love your studio. That's first. The second is going to be your social your social posts, a lot of inquiries. What might happen is that it, that generates the leads and then you can follow up with those leads. Those leads might convert the following semester. Some percentage will convert right away, but the following semester I've noticed from the social, um, the social leads, there's like a little bit, yet we have to nurture them a little bit, get to know the, the clients who are already coming, they love us. Now we have to make those people love us, right? Or those people might go to a different Pilates studio, and so they don't want to cheat on that Pilates studio, but they want to get trained. So there's sometimes there's that emotional dynamic, and we have to make sure that we let them know we're not trying to steal you from anybody. But if you want to, if you want to become a teacher, this is what we're offering. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so now for the teachers, um, getting back again to the questions that a lot of the new aspiring teachers have. Um, and one of the struggles, I was actually talking um, to one of my clients yesterday, and she mentioned that one of her teachers is at, going through a teacher training program at another studio because she doesn't have one, you know. Mm -hmm. But she said, like, right now that person her student her studio student is at a time where she needs to start apprenticing but she is terrified of teaching yeah. because it's one thing going in into the teacher training and you know like working with the other instructors who know they basically yeah. they do things before you even tell them what to do because they know their body and all that and Right. The other thing, when a client shows up and you tell them to lift their right arm and they just lift their left leg. Left leg. <laughs> right. I know. Or like they, they come up with some really strange injury or something that hurts right. when you're doing something that shouldn't be hurting. And all of a sudden it's like deer in the headlights, look for the teacher and they get frustrated. Okay. So the question is, in your program, how do you approach that? learning to teach the body in front of you and building the confidence to teach that body in front of you. So that is like such a great, um, it's such a great question the way you described it too, because it's exactly, it's like I could have the same story a hundred times with each apprentice every semester. Like they are, and I remember my first class and I tell them the story of my first class and how I just, it just had to be done. We had our, you know, beginner seminar and literally at the end Sunday of the beginner seminar, they assigned us beginner classes that we had to teach starting the following week, full 50 minute classes. So I tell them the story and how I went through it and, and you know, how the first class I taught, I went through the beginner system in 50 minutes. I did it three times because I spoke so fast and I was so nervous and I think I forgot four exercises and it was like 10 minutes and I was at the end and I was like, okay, we're going to do the hundred again. <laughs> right. So, so I, and, and that helps to sort of disarm them. Like when you tell them what your story is and if you are the owner or you're the mentor or you're me, telling them that that's, you know, it helps calm their nerves. Like, okay, this is the normal starting place to feel this way. Now, what I do in my program, I give homework. So at the end of every seminar or really every week, 
I give out homework on things that I want them to do that break this process down into small bite-sized nuggets, as opposed to looking at it in totality. Looking at it in totality is so huge and so overwhelming. And you're like, but what if she has a hip replacement? And what if she has a herniated disc? And oh my God, she wins. Does that mean I hurt her, right? Like, so let's break it into smaller pieces. So each week I ask them to master a different series, master it. So only teach that series the whole week. Teach it to yourself, teach it to your mom, teach it to your husband, teach it at home, say it in the shower, say it in the car line, listen to the video. So this week it might be the short box series or the ab series, whatever it is. And now we're going to build out from there. So by the time four weeks goes by, they've got a solid, they have said it so many times, they have done it so many times, that they can really start to embody it. And then when they get to that real person, maybe four weeks after, because I usually don't want them teaching real bodies for a couple of weeks, stay within a comfort zone, that that confidence now is there because they've taught each one of the series you know, in an isolated way so many times that their confidence has built in these small nuggets, right? And all of a sudden they're like, oh, wait, okay, I, I can do the knee stretch series. Oh, wait, I can do elephant. Oh, wait, you know, like, and it doesn't seem so overwhelming when you break it down into small little pieces. The other part that I always remind them is the client does not know if you made a mistake. So just make a mistake with confidence, right? You just make that mistake with confidence. You're not going to break anybody with the beginner system. You're not, it's safe. So just, if the client says they can't do rotation, then just don't do rotation, right? Know your rotation exercises and pluck them out and leave them over here. But for the most part, beginner system is pretty darn safe for most people. So may, if you forgot something, don't say, oh, wait, I forgot and go back. Just keep on going. Just keep on going. It's all good. It's all good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, I know at the beginning you showed us a little bit of your manual, and I wanted just mm -hmm. to kind of focus a couple more minutes here, maybe getting like a little sneak peek into the yeah. program for people who might yeah. be interested, because I think you have a new fall semester starting soon, right? I do. Yep. September 30th is our beginner weekend. Okay. So here we go, right? Perfect timing. <laughs> yes, exactly. So can you show us, um, I don't know, like, how would you? What do you think would be the best way for you just to give us a little sneak peek? Maybe just go. Sure. For... If you, if I can share my, oh, I can share my screen. Yeah, you should let be me, able to. Let, let me do that. Oh, wait, hold on. I have to go back to the actual page. All right. I set it up ahead of time in case uh, you wanted to see anything. I'm going to let me go back to Zoom, share screen. Where are you? Uh, there it is. Okay. All right, so after a person registers, um, they will be brought to this page. So this is Reformer and Matt only. I, I do Reformer and Matt together. And then people can add on Cadillac chair and barrels as they if they want to and at a later point. And the reason I do that is not every studio is equipped with all of this. So not every studio is a comprehensive studio. So I don't wanna oversell a student on something they don't have access to mm -hmm. practice on. So they'll be brought to this page and this is the first page. So let's just do, these are all the different sort of, you know, areas. Let's go, we have our introduction, we have our principles, fundamentals. Let's go reformer, okay? So we have our beginner reformer, beginner reformer, common problems. And then I have the mat, that's weird. Uh, introduction, I have to, Oh, the order of exercises. It's giving them the, the next section of order of exercises. I forgot I'd put that in there. So now we have each exercise and a video about that exercise. We have our objective, our technique, body scan, approximate repetition, springs, and what muscles are engaged. So here is sort of the study material, and then each one has a video so you can hear my voice teaching it. Mm -hmm. I teach it as you would on day one, 
as you would on day five and as you would on day like 15, 20, like someone who knows what they're doing when they come in. I won't press play because my voice is very annoying. <laughs> so now if we go back, I then have a section of common problems. So what are the common problems with footwork? Footwork, the shoulder blocks feel too heavy or uncomfortable. So rather than someone jumping and maybe taking off a spring to make it feel lighter, let's try to problem solve, right? So we, instead of, prob, instead of uh, taking off and lightening, why don't we cue them to pull their shoulders down? Chances are they're jamming their shoulders up into the shoulder blocks. And that's why the shoulder blocks are uncomfortable. So try these cues, slide the shoulders down the back, roll the blades onto your back and see if that helps reposition them before you go ahead and take off a spring. If it still is uncomfortable, then you can take off the spring and move on. The head tilts over the headrest, the open rib cage, our hip alignment. So these are all common problems to help develop the Pilates eye. It's going to help that teacher, that new and emerging teacher, see, what, um, see what's going on, almost as though the skin is being removed, right? This is what might be going on and why you're seeing what you're seeing. How can we correct it? So I do that for all of the exercises in the beginner and in the intermediate, both mat and reformer. I don't do it for advanced because part of what advanced is, is I want the teacher to be able to know what those common problems are, or how to correct it at that point, like their eye should be developed. So in addition to this, um, which I, I don't have in this, I have it in a Vimeo, um, in a Vimeo uh, folder, is I have uh, the muscle of the week, which is a every week I send out a 10 minute mini workshop on a particular muscle to try to make it approachable and try to make it feel not so intimidating. Anatomy, anatomy can be a barrier to entry for some people. They get nervous by it. Mm -hmm. So the muscle of the week gives it a personality. It's bite size again, one little thing. So that's a video that goes out every week. And then we have our workshops, which are live every week, uh, one hour, and they're on all different topics. Then the hard copy manual and then the seminars. Awesome. Yeah, it's like there's no way to not be able to learn with all these different ways correct. to consume information. Um, that and is like correct. When I was going through the teacher training, one of the things like you would hear different things that the instructor would mention and you would just be jotting mm -hmm. it down in my manual, which I love. But then at some point, it's like, oh, I got distracted. I didn't write that down or I forgot what was right. said at that moment. That's and right. You have it. Or you go home. Right. Or you go home and you look at your notes and you're like, wait, what did I mean by that? What did she mean by like, because the context is gone. Right. Mm -hmm. So having those videos reinforces all of that. And so you can listen and learn and listen. And the repetition is there for people. And how long do the students have access to those videos during the course? Forever. For, oh, wow. So yeah, they can just keep coming back and coming back and Yep. Once you're in, once I get my claws in you, I'm not letting you go. <laughs> you, you're stuck with me for life. You're stuck with me for life. Awesome, Jessica. Well, that was really, um, I learned a lot about your program and just overall the idea of bringing teacher training to the studio, what's involved in it, how to train those students, how to develop, even for people who might be going through a teacher training through a different program, taking some of those notes, some of those tips from you, I think is going to really help them simplify the process so that they don't get overwhelmed. And we talked at the beginning, like about your courage. So obviously you said like you never lacked it. Um, and you seem like a very motivated person. You have that drive. So yeah. what, just personally, not specifically with Pilates, what is the source of your personal drive, do you think? I, I, you know, it's funny, you, I don't, I don't actually can't put my finger on it. I <laughs> love what I do. I love what I do. I really don't have hobbies. This is my hobby. So when I have free time, I'm looking at something new and different, a different way of approaching it. Uh, and I'm putting it into action, testing it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But it's, it's sort of, I, I kind of just plow through anything that might be in front of me and try whatever it is I want to try. So 
I wish I had knew that there was some sort of secret sauce that kept me, uh, kept me motivated that I could say it's my daily meditation. It's not, it's just, it's, it's just how I built. It's just how I built. I've been building businesses. I think since I was in middle school, um, you know, just on, on small, small, small levels. And now here I am. Uh, well, I think it's, you're a perfect, um, visualization of like the perfect poster child for the passion business owner because yes, you yes. took your passion and build the entire business out of it and that's what drives it because if you love what you do every day that you do it why not do it exactly i i completely agree i completely <laughs> agree i don't know how not to do it i'm kind of annoying to be around to be completely honest <laughs> Awesome. So I want to just to close our interview here. I want to encourage everyone who will listen to the interview to check out Jessica's website. It's evolveyourstudio.com. You can sign up for her newsletter. You know, it's pretty easy to spot there. Uh, if you want to be notified about any of the teacher training uh, seminars, any of her news, anything uh, that's going on, any of her offerings. Um, also, she has a really great section on her blog on her website that um, deals with common questions that especially a lot of teachers ask, um, like beginner teachers, and I was looking through some of them uh, lately, it, you know, it, you know, things that you might think about and like wouldn't even know who to ask. Um, right. Even I think what was one of them? I, it's like an advice column. And it's there, there are yeah. real questions that I have gotten from apprentices, student teachers, employees, clients over time. And so I've turned it into an advice column as my blog. So it's, it ranges. There's a whole variety of, of from the crazy, funny situation questions mm -hmm. to more special case anatomical questions that are in there. And I keep adding to it. Yeah, I think uh, one of them, yeah, um, that's the one that caught my eye, um, is that my clients want to do stuff they see on Instagram. I know yes. that was one of the things that some of my clients said, like some of the ones who right. felt they were more advanced and right. you know, they knew Pilates. So that was definitely something um, I had questions about, like, man, like, what do you do with that? Especially, right. with, yeah, the, the, you can see some quite crazy stuff on Instagram. Yes, anyway. you can. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I encourage everybody to uh, get in touch with Jessica if you're interested about either being a host studio for her teacher training or if you're interested in being trained and looking for a studio nearby to get your training done. Um, and also you know, sign up for her newsletter and follow her on all her social profiles. I'll make sure to link to all of those under the Thank interview you. as well. Thank, Thank you so much. This was fun, Anastasia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica.